Hello, gentlemen. Top Hat Gaming Man here, the manliest gaming channel on the whole of the information superhighway. Speaking of exciting futuristic things, such as the World Wide Web, did you know that gaming online is not a fairly new thing? In fact, this is a means of entertainment that stretches back to some of the very earliest games consoles in the existence of the Homo sapien race. In this video, we are going to look at two devices which allowed games to be downloaded back in the very early 1980s. There are often misconceptions about what the first online system actually was. The obvious choice would be the Sega Dreamcast, since it was the system that made huge breakthroughs in terms of online usage. Some more educated gamers, on the other hand, may point their grubby little fingers towards the Sega Saturn, since the platform was fully online in the likes of Japan. But we have to go way further back in time in order to get to online console gaming's genesis. And when I say genesis, I'm talking way before the Sega Genesis as well. So, without further ado, let's take a look at some of the earliest examples of online console gaming. Our journey starts in 1980 with the humble Mattel in television the platform which would go up against the established Atari 2600 platform. The Intellivision is famous for being a more powerful alternative to the likes of what Atari had on the market at the time. Despite this, the system only ever managed to shift a pitiful 3 million units, which is less than the likes of the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC 464 and many other platforms over the period. The system may have lacked sales in comparison to many other notable consumer electronics, however the Intellivision had an interesting peripheral which rarely gets mentioned within the YouTube echo chamber, which pioneered and paved the way for how many gamers would purchase and consume in the distant future. In 1980, Intellivision marketed a device called the Play Cable. The Play Cable was set up to receive downloadable games through cable television. The service itself was a subscription service and was the first ever of its type. However, due to the high cost and limitations of the Play Cable adapter and the high cost on the cable companies for sending the games, it was not highly adopted. The service itself was discontinued in 1983 and was perhaps only a failure on the basis it was much too ahead of its time. Very much like Galileo. So, if you didn't believe in the services this product offered, you would have been no better than a flat earther. So, whilst the play cable may have been discontinued in 1983, another service on a different gaming platform was only just setting out on its maiden voyage. Within this year, those corporate vultures at Atari would swoop in to try to eat the rotten fouled corpse of the play cable, with their own attempt at this niche, lovingly named the Game Line. The game line was a little bit more high tech than the play cable. This subscription service would have allowed for a modem to be installed with a storage cartridge which would be inserted into the Atari 2600. The game line varied from the play cable as it would hook up to the telephone line instead of receiving a signal through cable television. Whilst the game line was an exciting and innovative product, sadly it disappeared as quickly as it appeared. Most likely due to the fact that 1983 was the year of the North American regional Atari crash, which was a result of consumers realising that within their country they were gaming on out of date pieces of rubbish. It would take the USA a few years to catch up with the likes of Europe who were spending all of their gaming time on microcomputers as opposed to by that point old 70s tat. The American games consoles may have been primitive for the time period in terms of power and what they could do. However, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that the Intellivision Play Cable was one of those creations that was far too ahead of its time and despite being a great idea, the technology was not able to support it. Focusing in on just the Play Cable for a moment, Mattel, who were the creators of the Intellivision, developed the Play Cable as a joint venture with a company called General Instrument. They were actually working on this idea many years before the Intellivision was even released. By 1979, they were even testing the play cable in various cities around North America. 
The service itself was brought to the market officially in June 1980. Subscribers paid a monthly fee, which gave them access to 20 different games per month to choose from. It sounded like a great product. However, it was only available in just over a dozen cities. The reason for this is that it was run through cable. This meant Mattel and General Instrument needed to get the cable providers on board. The main issue for the cable providers was that the computers and servers etc which were needed to make the service work were very expensive to both obtain and run. For consumers, part of the agreement was that they didn't actually own the adapter, so the cost of this was covered as part of the monthly account fee. To make matters worse, the adapters weren't necessarily powerful enough to play some of the larger games. In fact, as soon as the games was larger than 8 kilobytes, the adapter would fail. All of this, combined with those monsters known as Atari causing the regional North American console crash, meant that the service was doomed to fail. Then, to top it all off, as the adapter was rented, consumers had to send it back after the service was discontinued. So, that was the play cable done and dusted with. Which brings us back around to the history of the Atari game line. Atari's dial-up distribution service, which was developed and operated by the Control Video Corporation. Stepping back to a couple of years prior, there was a chap called William Von Meister. He too had created some transmission technology, which could transfer data through the cable system as well. However, as his tech was based on music rather than games, the cable companies were loath to take this on. There were issues with copyright and other legalities, which put the companies off. This meant he had some great technology and nothing to bloody do with it. Meister decided to convert his technology into a modem, which could handle games rather than music. Whether this was off the back of hearing about the play cable or not, I can't say for certain. However, it does seem so, doesn't it? After all, Mattel had been able to achieve what he had not. Anyway, Meister decided to change his technology somewhat to give him an edge over the competition. He too used centralised servers, but rather than using the cable signal, he used telephone wires instead. This was the birth of the Atari game line. On this service, games could be downloaded, and much like video and game rental, could be played for between 5 to 10 days before the user would then need to download another game. Each user had their own PIN, which was used to log into the central server and download whichever game it was that they wanted. Users were also awarded a free game on their birthday. What a delight! Other benefits included competitions, leaderboards, high scores, regional prizes, Q&As and physical prizes. Yeah! One prize, apparently, was a waterproof coat. Which is hilarious when you consider that only people who would have been genuinely interested with a product like this at the time would have been anoraks themselves anyway. So why not give an anorak to an anorak? Something else of note was that each subscriber would receive a magazine called Game Liner, which kept them updated on new games as well as other information about the services available. Now, I'm not sure about you, but this reminds me an awful lot of the Nintendo eShop and so on. I wouldn't be surprised if this was the inspiration of a lot of future projects once technology managed to actually catch up with these great ideas. One of the reasons I think this is because apparently they intended to have more than just the games available. They were looking at news, sports news, mail and even banking and horoscopes. In a way, I suppose this was a teletext before teletext. Does this mean Mr Biffo ripped off Atari 2? As futuristic as this technology was, for the humble video computer system, the world just was not ready for this sort of technology yet. Like the play cable, the Atari game line was a complete bust. Despite the loss of the game line, the founding members of the Control Video Corporation and many of their investors would go on to create a new company which would build upon what the game line started. The company was initially called Quantum Computer Services and would team up with Commodore to make use of the tech which the game line had initially offered. In October of 1991, Quantum Computer Services would officially rebrand as a little company known as America Online, or AOL to some. However, I do not expect you to have heard of it. You have mail. So, whilst both of these early innovative products were both failures, the waves in which these devices set in motion would slowly gain traction and contribute to shaping the entire modern world as we know it. 
There was more to the world of American games consoles in 1983 than the same repetitive stories in which you hear from most so-called historians and YouTubers. In my humble opinion, the intertwined story of the Atari game line and in television play cable is as interesting as they come. If we were to have forgone these innovations, who knows whether the Control Video Corporation would have still ended up going on to become AOL. The birth of online gaming on consoles all started here, and without these early steps, who knows how much slower technology would have progressed without these baby steps taken by the likes of Atari and Mattel. So please, next time when someone mentions Americans gaming in 1983, forget about all that E.T. nonsense and celebrate the Atari game line. Yeah. Thank you for watching today's video, do not forget to like the video and hit the subscribe button for in-depth content on gaming history every single week. Let me know in the comment section if you know any intriguing overlooked parts of gaming history which you think deserve an in-depth look at on this channel. Let's all learn together gentlemen. My channel Top Hat Gaming Man is partly funded from a fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. I would like to thank all of you for continuing to support the Top Hat Trust. So, shout outs to Carl Johnson, Suka Kobayashi, Stuart McDermott, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Verhaley, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Edward O'Reilly, Michael Keneally, Tom Elliott, Marcus Hines, Gary Pinkett, the Gaming Muso, SpongeMat B, Quang DX, and all of my other beautiful patrons. You people constantly motivate me to make more videos. You improve my life, actually. So, as always, from the bottom of my heart, thank you ever so much. Cheerio!